awesome job. <laughs> if you could hack the uh, air conditioning to come on in those things, that'd be awesome because it's like a B.O. box in those mothers. Um, thanks to everybody for coming to this HOPE conference. Uh, these wouldn't happen without the support of you um, and Emmanuel Goldstein and the guys at 2600 have worked for months to bring this together. So thank you for attending. Um, Stephen Levy is the author of Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, which was published in 1984, same year that uh, 2600 The Hacker Quarterly came out. Um, he's written several books on computers, all of which he'll be signing after this discussion. Um, he'll be signing Best of Technology Writing and The Perfect Thing. He was a technology writer for uh, Newsweek um, and a senior editor at Newsweek. He is now with Wired Magazine. And without further ado, Stephen Levy. Thank you, and hello, hackers. You know, it, it's really fantastic to be able to address a gathering that proudly, uh, people proudly call themselves hackers. Uh, that word's been over uh, quite a lot over the last 25 years, and it, it means a lot to me. And it's also great to be speaking to an audience in my uh, adopted hometown, New York City. I hope you're all enjoying it there. And also, thanks for getting up so early in the morning. <laughs> so I, I want to talk today a, a bit about uh, what the word hacker means to me and I want to do something that I've never actually really done before is to talk a bit about the process of, of how I wrote this book called Hackers. Uh, as was mentioned and I hope some of you know about it, uh, I did write a, a, a book called Hackers. It was not the source material for the movie starring Angelina Jolie, <laughs> which was a circumstance which was bad for my bank account but good for my dignity. Um, but, uh, you know, the, I think uh, my writing that book had something to do with my uh, speaking here today. I want to share some, some things about uh, how I wrote it and what happened to the word hacker since and, uh, you know, to take a, a little look at where I was right and where I was wrong. And also, I'm going to have something special also, a little, try to figure out after I talk and before I take questions, and I do want to take questions, to run a little contest. I went to my private stash and I have here... Uh, a pretty pristine version of the hardback copy of Hackers, which I'd like to give to some uh, person, certainly a person who would consider him or herself lucky to get it. So I'm um, trying to figure out a way to run uh, a relatively painless little contest where someone can get this book to take home there. So how did I come to write that book, uh, a book that changed my life and, you know, uh, amazingly, uh, has changed the life of some people who read it, uh, according to what they tell me. So let's go back to a time long ago. Uh, I won't try to hide my age here. And this is around the time that Ronald Reagan was taking the oath of office and mastodons roamed the earth. <laughs> I was a freelance writer. I was writing general subjects, which was what happens when you become an English major. I wrote about sports and uh, you know, music and murders and, and things like that. I interviewed uh, Bruce Springsteen and Bob Marley and Dr. J. One little digression, if you'll allow me, uh, just because I, I just can't believe I did this. In interviewing Bob Marley actually was one of the more amazing things uh, I did. I was writing an article, believe it or not, for the Philadelphia Inquirer Sunday Magazine about reggae, trying to explain reggae to the good people in suburban Philadelphia. And uh, there was a guy in my food co-op, I was living in the Germantown section of Philadelphia, who insisted, he knew Bob Marley, right? He said, oh, I know Bob, I know Bob, and I can get you an interview, no problem. And yeah, sure, sure. And one day he said, hey, Bob is at his mother's house in Wilmington, Delaware, and he'll talk to you. And I got in my Volkswagen and drove down there with, with Simeon, uh, my host, and believe it or not, there was Bob Marley sitting there. And I always found that when doing questions. It wasn't so methodical then, but now it 
it's the way I do things, that sometimes the stupidest question will get the very best answer. So if you're willing to make yourself into sort of an idiot during the interviewing process, it could, it could pay off big time. So I asked Bob Marley, uh, you know, despite a real impulse to prove that, you know, I was a hip guy, I said, really, what, for the readers of the Philippine Inquirer there, what, what is reggae really? And instead of just brushing me off, he just kind of got all quiet. And he's sitting there in his mom's living room without a shirt on, and it's all dark. He says, you know, you know that quiet before the hurricane comes? That's reggae. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? So one day I got this assignment to write about these people called hackers. And this is about 1981. I'd never touched a computer before and you know, didn't know much about them. Around the time, the big controversy among writers is whether we should get these things called electronic typewriters, right, which kind of remembered one line of what we did. Uh, and you know, a lot of people thought, you know, boy, you really wouldn't want one of these ugly things with a screen on your desk. That's, that's kind of lunatic. Uh, but I thought, you know, this is the kind of an interesting idea. And I looked into it, I, and I checked out the literature. And uh, there wasn't very much about people called hackers. Uh, if, if there was, you know, uh, pretty much the definition would be uh, hacker. Antisocial nerd, by and large a loser who is addicted to computers. Maybe dangerous, but mainly a booger stained curiosity. Okay, I thought I, I could do this. <laughs> well, there it is. I, are you proud of that, or do, or do you still do that? Well, I. I, I Please let me know so I won't sit in your chair afterwards. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so I, I looked for stuff about hackers, and I, I found a, an article in Psychology Today. It was a cover story. It was called The Hacker Papers, and it had a picture of, of some really creepy-looking guy on, on the cover. The article uh, actually was a, an edited uh, you know, version of some... Uh, dialogue that had gone on at Stanford University, edited by this uh, psychology professor named Philip Zimbardo, who actually I, I, I met rel relatively recently, and he, he's been doing some really interesting stuff on Abu Ghraib and the psychology of evil. But back then, you know, he was at Stanford doing these things about hackers, and he wrote, um, and this is his take on the paper, fascination with the computer becomes an addiction. And as with most social addictions, the substance that gets abused is human relationships. And this was seconded in a book with one of the few passages about hacking that, that, that I could find. This book was written by uh, an MIT professor named Joseph Weizenbaum. Now, he's best known for writing that program, Eliza, where uh, it, it's like a psychiatrist session. You type in something, and the uh, computer flicks back your question at you, and it, and it seems like a, uh, a session with a psychologist there. But he also wrote a book called uh, Computer Power and Human Reason. And he had very one distinctive passage that became sort of notorious at MIT, and it was not very flattering. Let me read you that. Bright young men of disheveled appearance, often with sunken, glowing eyes, can be seen sitting at computer consoles, their arms tensed and waiting to fire their fingers, already poised to strike at the button and keys on which their attention seems to be riveted as if a gambler's on the rolling dice. When not so transfixed, they often sit at tables strewn with computer printouts over which they pour like possessed students of a Kabbalistic text. They work until they nearly drop, 20, 30 hours at a time. Their food, if they arrange it, is brought to them. Coffee, Cokes, sandwiches. If possible, they sleep on cots near the printouts. Their rumpled clothes, their unwashed and unshaven faces, and their uncombed hair all testify that they are oblivious to their bodies and to the world in which they move. Those, these are computer bums, compulsive programmers. Well, this is straight out of Dostoevsky, right? You couldn't get a more gloomy or more depressing group of people. You know, if Angelina Jolie had seen this, she wouldn't want to portray a hacker. She'd probably want to adopt one. <laughs> so, so I figured, okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll do this story. I'll write about these weirdos, and I'll go to Stanford because that's the place that was in the psychology today. But before I left, I uh, tapped a former colleague who had been writing about technology a little, and asked him to give me a list of sources I might talk to out there. And he presented me with a list of some key people in the burgeoning PC industry there, and some other people um, you know, involved in some interesting computer stuff. So I get on a plane, fly out to California. I'd only been there once in my life before in a college trip, uh, like a road trip there, and uh, hadn't 
done anything about, about computers there, let me tell you. And uh, got off the plane. Within four hours, I was in a hot tub with this guy, Jim Warren, who founded the Computer Fair, along with a couple of people who lived in his property who were editing a magazine for him about uh, beaming data on radio sideband. And I was learning about how computers empowered, empowered people and you know, were actually exciting. And this is like a, a tone which set for the entire trip. And I went to Stanford and I talked to other people uh, in the PC industry and entrepreneurs and uh, you know, engineers and other people doing interesting stuff. And I was totally blown away by what I found. These were not antisocial nerds but adventurers of the mind, you know, and their thought processes to me were utterly fascinating. And what's more, they were on to something. I, talking to them, I realized that the things they were doing were things that all of us were going to be doing, everyone was going to be doing, uh, in, in, in not too long. And, you know, this was a world that I hadn't seen, and I got really excited about it, and wrote my story, and wanted to just continue writing, writing more and more about it. I also, uh, as soon as I got home, said to my girlfriend, who's now my wife, we, we've just got to get these things. And we both bought uh, Apple IIs at the time. They cost, uh, for two Apple IIs uh, and one printer, which we shared, we spent $9,500. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was worth it, man. Um, and, 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 and I started writing about it. It was kind of funny. Back then, again, not too many people who weren't, uh, technoids had computers, and I remember about a year after we got the, the computers, uh, uh, one, a popular, popular computing magazine, one of the magazines uh, at the time, ran a, uh, did a story on women and, and computing, and they had a full page picture of my wife, not because she was anything technically proficient, she really didn't know anything about programming or things like that, she just simply used a computer. Wow, a woman using a computer, imagine that. It, w it would be like now someone doing an article on women in pencils, right? <laughs> so, so around that time, a publisher asked me if I was interested in writing a book about hackers. Uh, so I've been writing about more. And again, I thought, well, gee, this is kind of a good idea. I'd, I'd wanted to write a book for a while. I had a proposal circulating, uh, believe it or not, to write a book about cheesy nightclub singers. Uh, that wasn't catching on. So I thought, you know, hackers, great. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And I thought, it was my first book, I was a little nervous. You know, how am I going to get this done? It's much longer than anything I've ever done. But I'll maybe write a chapter about this kind of hacker, and maybe a chapter about that, and I'll just kind of write chapter after chapter until finally I had a, a book's worth of stuff, and I'll put that up, and that will be my book about hackers. But my editor, a guy named James Rames, uh, he, had a, you know, he, he was really great. He said to me, listen, I, I want you to think big, be ambitious. And uh, Tim O'Reilly, uh, who you know, runs the food camps and O'Reilly Publishing, has a saying that you should always try big, hairy, audacious goals. And, of course, I didn't know Tim O'Reilly then, um, and maybe he wasn't even saying that then, but uh, that's essentially what my editor told me to try to do. And I think, let me try to do this. Let me go for it. Why not? Now's the time. So I decided instead of just kind of piling chapter upon chapter, I would try to write this thing like a narrative. It would be an epic story about how these rebels changed the world. And that's how I got the idea of hackers, heroes of the computer revolution. So I ventured off doing this with uh, you know, sort of a miserable little advance uh, for my miserable little uh, contract there. And I eventually thought, well, I guess there'll be two pieces to this book. The first will be uh, the Homebrew Computer Club, the people who gathered in March 1975 after they heard about the Altair computer, the first personal computer being uh, released. And of course, as a kit, you had to put together yourself. And from this little group that met in a garage, uh, all these companies sprang, including Apple Computers. Steve Wozniak went to the Homebrew Computer Club, and to impress his friends, he built the Apple One and, you know, and, and you know, showed it to them as the first really uh, cool color computer. And he met Steve Jobs, and they made the Apple II, and, and, and that's history. But there was a, just a lot of interesting things happening there, and I saw how those hardware hackers in the 1970s really created the, the personal computer revolution. And then I wanted to do something in real time, and I had been hanging out with these people in the game hacking world, and I thought I would hang out at this company in, near the uh, 
uh, Sierras near uh, Yosemite uh, called uh, Sierra Online in Coarse Gold, California. And they allowed me total access to the company so I could hang out and talk about people who actually learned to hack on personal computers. And it was interesting because money for the first time was coming into the equation. So I would do these two pieces and that would be my book. But as I went on and talked to people, I realized that actually there was a, a third part of it, an earlier part, because all roads seem to lead to what happened in the late 50s and early 60s, and in one place specifically, which was MIT. And as I talked to other people, I realized, you know, it, it actually feels like hacker culture began there at MIT. So I really have to add a third section to my book, and that will be the lead section, the opening section. And when I did that, and it was called True Hackers, in which I wrote about MIT in the late 50s and early 60s. And to me, it turned out my favorite part of the book, and the part which really resonates to this day. And, uh, you know, it, it was just thrilling to be able to talk to these people. No journalist had ever gone near them before and to tell their story there. So even before I did that, I, you know, of course, I met a lot of interesting people uh, during the course of, of, of interviewing there. Steve Wozniak, of course, uh, was great. He was super generous with his time and you know, really shared with me what goes on inside a hacker's head. I didn't talk to Steve Jobs during the course of doing hackers. Uh, right after I finished the book, uh, the Macintosh was about to come out. And I did get an assignment for Rolling Stone to write about the Mac, uh, which hadn't come out yet, and I got Apple to let me in uh, a couple months before they, they released it. And that's when I first met Steve. It was kind of interesting because uh, you know, I, it was the end of a day that just, again, blew my mind. It was sort of akin to the first day uh, I was researching hackers. Uh, and I met all these amazing people, and of course saw this amazing computer. The people I met that day, people like Andy Hertzfeld and Bill Atkinson and Susan Kerr, the Macintosh artists, are, are my friends to this day. And of course the computer I met that day is my computer to this day. So it was, it was, it was a big deal for me. At the end of the day, I was supposed to meet Steve Jobs, and we were going to go out to dinner there. And you know, uh, I heard a lot about him, and I thought, what is this guy really like? So you know, we meet out in the lobby of this uh, Banley Three, the building where they did the Macintosh, and immediately he launches into this tirade. You know, because I was doing this story for Rolling Stone, he said, now I was just on an airplane, and I was reading a copy of Rolling Stone, and there was this cover story about MTV, and it was awful. And he started proceeding, just trashing the story left and right, and using horrible uh, analogies to body functions, to gross body functions to talk about this story. And he kept talking and talking. And I wondered, when is he going to take a breath so I could tell him that I wrote that story? <laughs> And I finally did, and he, he just kind of just changed the subject and, and, wound, and wound up giving a great interview. You know, and Steve it, it is not uh, really a, a hacker. He's more of an artist mentality. You know, you would never have a hacker whose obsession is to have fewer and fewer and fewer buttons on a device, which is sort of Steve's goal. You know, the iPhone, he's got it down to one button, and eventually it's just going to be no buttons. Like, you know, and there's just going to be a sort of head meld with the device, whatever it is. But, but it is pretty cool, I guess, to be a hacker to try to implement those ideas, to put one button on, ordering off information and, 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 and codifying it and, you know, keeping you away from it. And that's why hackers hate authority, because authority keeps them away from information. So, you know, I, I felt that, I guess, maybe my, my key contribution in the book really is to, to try to codify that. And, you know, and, and it really came out in every single way uh, that you looked at that culture at MIT. I was downstairs a few minutes ago, and I saw a, a you know, pretty big contingent of lock hacking groups. And lock hacking really got its start, I think, at, at MIT there. You know, because just as hackers hated locks on computers, uh, you know, they hated physical locks. They felt you should be able to get information everywhere. So there was this constant war going on between administrators who wanted to keep things locked up and the hackers who wanted to open things up. A hacker named David Silver kind of laid it out for me. And, um, you know, this is the last thing I'll read. It's just a great passage there where uh, he talks about uh, it was uh, ultra-highly clever warfare. There were administrators who have high security locks and have vaults where they would store the keys and have sign-out cards to issue keys. And they felt secure, like they were locking everything up and controlling things and preventing information from flowing the wrong way and things from being stolen. And then there was another side of the world where people felt that everything should be available to everyone. And these hackers had pounds and pounds and pounds of keys that would get into every conceivable place. The people who did this were very ethical and honest. And they weren't using this, this power to steal or injure. It was kind of a game, partly out of necessity and partly out of ego and fun. At the absolute height of it, if you were in the right inside circle, you can get the combination to any safe and you get access to anything. 
And this is really true. I mean, at one point, the administrators got so frustrated that they took this class two safe, which is qualified to hold government classified material, and they felt, well, now you know, we're protected there. But of, of course, the hackers uh, found one in a junkyard uh, in Taunton, a, a few miles away, and took it apart with a acetylene torch and learned how it worked, and they were able to crack that safe. And of course, all of them took locksmith courses, as I guess some of the people downstairs have too, and they had the licenses to make the, 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 the proper keys. And then there were some keys that the blanks were so secure that even licensed locksmiths couldn't do this. And in that case, they would like go into the machine shop and they would forge their own keys there. And you know, this poor guy who had to watch and, and the, protect the information at the uh, AI lab where this was going on at the, at the time, uh, this is in the 60s, this is a guy named Russell Nofsker. I really felt, felt for this guy because he was sort of a hacker himself. Uh, he had a, a pearl addiction shared with a lot of hackers is that he loved explosives. You know, and it's interesting. You know, I, I don't know why it is, but in talking to hackers over the years, there really seems to be like a fondness for blowing things up. So this guy, Nofsker, uh, one of the first jobs he had was work for a company that, that made explosives. And he actually arranged that have part of his salary in Primacord, which was sort of... <laughs> And, and, and an explosive device. And he had this idea that, uh, you know, this is Boston in the winter, that he could like set this up on his sidewalk and blow the snow off. And, <laughs> and, and his wife got wind of it, and, you know, so he, he had to shuffle, sh shovel the stuff anyway. But, you know, it, you know he, he tried and tried and tried to, to, to stop the hackers. Until so finally, he just, he just gave up. He threw his hands up and said, you know, and made a deal with the hackers. He said, okay, I'll stop putting up the roadblocks if you'll stop flaunting how you break into it. Let's at least preserve the illusion that things are safe. And this is sort of a precursor years, years in advance of Scott McNeely's statement that privacy is an illusion. Uh, they, they really had it at, at MIT. And it actually worked pretty well a after that. And one of the, the last people I talked to uh, doing hackers, and it turned out to be a sort of a postscript at the end of the book, was this guy I found, and I'm sure I was the first journalist who ever to speak to him, this guy named Richard Stallman. Um, <laughs> You know him. Uh, but, you know, uh, he looks, he, oh, I looked different too, I guess, but uh, he looked really different back then. And, you know, he was a, this guy. I don't, I don't think sunlighted his face for years before I, I, I talked to him. He, like, li literally lived in the AI lab. And at that point, the AI lab was splitting apart. You know, I, I get into this in, in the book because, you know, there were these companies that started uh, competing Lisp companies, and one of them, you know, run by Nofsker, actually, uh, Stallman thought was evil, and he was single-handedly trying to match the output of that other company. And, you know, uh, he, he was just, his heart was broken because the AI lab uh, was being ruined by proprietary information and software for money and uh, passwords, uh, he hated passwords, and he had this movement within the AI lab to use a carriage return as a password. And about a third of the people actually kind of used that, you know, as proudly saying, you know, we, we don't want your stinking passwords, and they use a, a, a carriage return there. And, you know, he described himself as the, uh, like, uh, there's this book called Ishii, The Last Yahi, about this, you know, indigenous American in, in California who was the last of, of his kind, and he thought he, he was that. And I wrote a chapter about him called The, you know, the Last uh, True Hacker there. And, you know, uh, little realizing that Richard, you know, years from now would still be, uh, you know, a, a true hacker, but quite joyfully, you know, I feel, and to all people in this room, certainly not, not the last of, of them. And it was kind of funny, because when I finished Hackers, I had somewhat of a pessimistic view of how mammon, how commerce, how greed was going to affect the hacker ethic. And I, you know, I worried a lot about how that would turn out. But as it turned out, not only did the hacker spirit infuse everything, you know, by you know, being built in to every computer. And then the people who designed the internet you know, were, again, true hackers. And that permeated the whole internet and spread the, the hacker ethic everywhere. Uh, you know, but you know, look, now the, the, the idea of hacking in the, the classic sense, I think, is making a comeback. And I really feel that all the benefits we have of the digital age and the whole devolution, uh, evolution that, that, that came from that, all the things we enjoy now really came from the hackers. We owe it all to the hackers. So I handed in my book, 
um, you know, I, on my Apple II, you know, just to think how different things are. Some chapters of the book were so long they didn't fit on a single floppy disk. I had to, sp <laughs> to, to, to split it out there. And then, of course, my publisher wouldn't take a book in digital form. What? And in fact, they wouldn't even take it in a dot matrix printout. They demanded I, I make it look like a typewritten manuscript. I had to hire, I had to rent a daisy wheel printer, printer and kind of print it out like one line at a time. It was like 13 characters a second at that time. And you know, the book came out in you know, uh, late 1984, uh, came out in, in this version. They didn't print too many of them, sold out. But the uh, you know, publisher uh, said, well, that, that, that's good. Just leave it at that. And it wasn't really until the paperback that it really found its audience. And I'm just so happy to say that it's been in print ever since. And you know, uh, I, I just get great feedback uh, to, to this day there. Uh, just out, uh, just today I ran into Matt Blaze, who's a legend in his own right, and he told me that uh, he was asked uh, by the people at, at Penn, where he works, to pick a book which had an influence on him the most, and, and he picked Hackers. And th th thanks, Matt. That, that means a lot. Now, after I wrote the book, I had hoped that that term that I used, the way I used the word hackers, in the positive sense, in the adventurous sense, in the sense that people you know, who see freedom and liberation in, in what they do would stick. But of course, soon after that, uh, the word became degraded and became used to be synonymous with people who break into computers, whether they have technical expert expertise or not. And uh, there was a conference that started you know, just when the book started, uh, Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly, some people at Whole Earth Review, decided it would be a great idea to get together some of the people who were in the different generations of hackers and, and put them all together. And we had a fantastic uh, you know, gathering called the First Hacker Conference, and it still goes on uh, to this day. It's picked up by some other people. And in subsequent hacker conferences, there was a lot of hand-wringing about the way this word was used, that especially that uh, people were upset, the people who might just use scripts. They had no... Uh, expertise at hacking whatsoever, but people said, oh, these are hackers, these are hackers. And you know, so some of the people, people at MIT in particular, it broke their heart to hear that word used that way. Now, I, I have to say, I can't get that worked up about it because you know, language sort of has its own course. It's like a river. And you really can't stop a, a river that way. And I think, it, while it's a shame that that word can be abused to that, and I look now and, and see the word used to people who are just pure criminals with no uh, technical ex expertise, and I think, well, these aren't hackers, certainly not in my book, uh, and, and it's unfortunate, but I am just so encouraged that now the word is coming back in the positive sense in terms of, you know, people talk about hacking the brain, or you've got the Make Magazine movement, and, you know, or even gatherings like this, I think, uh, are breaking away from the, the strictly negative connotation and, and, and seeing it in, in the terms, you know, that was closer to the original. So I think that, that's, that's just ter terrific there. And, you know, uh, it's been, you know, great to see that evolution and happier, you know, I'm, I'm just happier than ever that this movement is thriving and that you're here and that you've read me and listened to me. So I just say, go forth and hack, please. And thanks very much. So, a couple things. I want to take questions so you can kind of go to the mic for questions. But first, can we have the house lights on? We're going to figure out how to give out this book here. Okay, I'm going to do a little uh, raffle hack without a, any kind of raffle. So, can I have the uh, house lights on? Can someone hack the house lights, please? <laughs> Maybe from your chair, some of you can do this. This is, this, is, this is a hard one, huh? We'll get a long distance 3G battery before this is on, okay? Uh, there we go, okay. So, here's the way I'm going to do it I've got a couple trivia questions. And there's going to be partly speed and partly who, who can answer this. So anyone who knows who was the inventor of the cellul cellular automata game life? <laughs> I didn't say yell it out. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, you know, so maybe I should get the ground rules of the game before I start here. I say working, working with hackers is going to be a little complicated, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the people who know something to stand up, okay? And if you don't want the book, don't stand up because you might wind up with a book if you win this trivia contest. So we all know, of course, that the inventor of life was John Conway, right? <laughs> so we're not going to use that question. Okay, so stand up if you want this book 
You, know, you can sell it on eBay. I'll sign it. Uh, what month was the first meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club? Anyone stand up who knows? Okay, we only have two people. Great, so it's between you guys. All right? Do either of you know Richard Stallman's middle initial? <laughs> and, 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 and the reason he knew, what's your name? Rohit. The reason Rohit knows is because, you know, he, his handle was RMS, right? And that, that was kind of well known. So come back afterwards, I'll sign this book there. Oh, March 1975. Did you know that? <laughs> So he hacked his way into that. So please, questions and on, on hackers or anything I've written about? Crypto, anything? Yeah. Stephen, I'm, I'm actually reading Crypto right now, and it's a great book. I, I have a question for you. You were talking about the information should be free, and that being a prime, you know, a prime thing. But then you have to reconcile it with privacy. And, and I think, you know, these days privacy is very important and, you know, we, we have a lot going on to try to make that very publicly available to people. How do you reconcile the two things? Information needs to be free, but you've got to have privacy. That's, uh, that, well, that's tough. I mean, it's a, so on one hand, uh, you know, the, the thing about crypto, and we sort of, you know, the flip side, really, of what happened at the AI lab was actually had its origin in the AI lab. On one hand, they had this ethic of total openness. And on the other hand, some of the people, and one person in particular, this guy Whit Giffey, who was a, a hacker at the AI lab, uh, had this obsession with how do you protect the secret. And he wound up to be the co-inventor of public key cryptography, which I think gives us a way to deal with the, the idea of, of, of free information in terms of protecting it with, with cryptography. I think that, you know, uh, clearly there's a value to privacy, but, um, you know, there is also uh, a huge value in making public information that has no, you know, justification to be held in, uh, in, in, in private there. Um, the nature of digital technology, uh, like it or not, brings a lot of our personal information out into the open. And there is a trade-off to what, what we do, I think by and large, by our actions. We vote with our feet. Just as young people, in a instance, vote on this issue with their feet when they post private information on Facebook. I think that you, know, you have to be you know, pretty dumb not to have any expectation at all that when you post something semi-publicly, it might not come out in, in the future there. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pretty it up. There's no perfect solution to this. But you know, I, I, I do feel that you know, things should be look more open. Uh, no DRM. DRM turns out to be real counterproductive. Um, but uh, in terms of your privacy, uh, one should be you know, careful about how much you indulge in the pleasures of the digital age if you're super concerned with that uh, or use strong crypto. Other questions? Come on, you're shot at me. The last, uh, uh, last hope? All right, well, I'll finish off, because I have a couple minutes, with one more story here. It has nothing to do with hacking. But, you know, it, it's before, when I was just this general freelance writer, I had an interesting story, which is sort of a hack in and of itself. My editor, I was working for a magazine called New Jersey Monthly, a regional magazine. And we tried to stretch any interesting story with a link to New Jersey as we could, because a lot of stuff happened in New Jersey wasn't too interesting. So uh, Einstein lived in New Jersey. And my editor always had this fascination about what happened to Einstein's brain. It had been taken out of his head after he died, fortunately, in 1955, and then sort of disappeared. Um, you know, the editor I had had tried to find it some years before and, and ran into a total brick wall. In the Einstein estate, said they didn't know what happened. The last he heard it was an article in the New York Times in 1955 saying that it was taken out of his head at the autopsy and sent off for study, but no one knew what happened to it. My editor said to me, I want you to find Einstein's brain. 
So, okay. So I, you know, just like the hackers, I, I, I could try that. So I figured out, I guess, what happened, who took it out of his head, the guy, and, you know, tried to trace the, the, the fellow down. I heard some like, rumors that the pieces of it had come out here and there. And finally I figured out where this guy was, and, you know, I was pretty sure this guy had the brain. He was a doctor, he was a pathologist who did the autopsy, and he was living in Wichita, Kansas, and working for some medical testing lab. So I called him up. I said, I'm doing this story about Einstein's brain. There's a silence. He said, what do you want to talk to me about? I said, well, I just wanted to talk to you about it. You knew Einstein, didn't you? And, the, and, I went, and he said, well, I did. And he seemed reluctant. And I thought this might be a hang-up any minute. So let me come out and talk to you. So I flew to Wichita, Kansas. And I met in his lab, which was, you know, in his testing lab. This guy, I guess it had once been a fairly renowned pathologist at Princeton Hospital, was now working in this sort of nondescript medical lab where they, you know, take your blood and, you know, let you know what happens there. And he was in this cubicle there. Um, and I met him, it was a Saturday, there was no one else there. And I'm asking about Einstein, and he admitted, yes, well, I took the brain out and, you know, was in charge of a study, and we talked about this a little, and, you know, kind of, it, it turned out that nothing was published, and, you know, that the study was going on, he couldn't say too much, and it, we just went on and on, I tried to get more and more, and finally I said, do you have any pictures of it, anything? And I come all the way from Wichita, to Wichita, from New Jersey, and he finally said, well, yeah, it, it's here. <laughs> I said, here? In, in this room? And he said, yeah. So he walks behind me. And in the back of my chair, there's a cardboard box. <laughs> and it says, Costa Cider. It's like a, the apple cider box. So the cardboard box. And he takes this thing, and he, and he pulls out two big kind of like mason jar kind of things. And, you know, the, and like there in these this mason, two mason jars split between them, bobbing up and down, <laughs> is Einstein's brain. And it's like cut up in like pieces. I described it as the size of Goldenberg's peanut chews. Um, and it was like an awesome moment. And, you know, it, uh, there it was, like the brain that changed the world. And, you know, so uh, that was my earlier coup. And I, I published the, the article, and it got picked up everywhere. Johnny Carson made a joke about it. Um, yeah, so that was the, the high point of my career uh, before <laughs> hackers, my Einstein's brain hack. So, again, keep hacking, have a great conference. Just a reminder, Stephen Levy will be signing uh, books right in the back of the room there. Uh, in our next discussion, if you are into uh, keys, uh, picking locks, that kind of thing. Some of the top uh, lock picking experts from around the world have flown in for this conference and they are going to be giving a, an in-depth discussion called Methods of Copying High Security Keys. Uh, Barry Wells is one of those gentlemen